Hi, thank you for joining me. We've been reading through A Course in Miracles, uh, the main text, chapter 21. And today we're going to finish, finish up chapter 21 with the inner shift. And I haven't read this in advance, so I don't know if we're going to have another uh, meltdown like we did last week. <laughs> Um, I have to tell you that when that happens, that is completely spontaneous and it is uh, my, you know, connection to divinity being, being um, activated there. When, when uh, I burst into tears over things like that, it is because the universe and divinity want us all to learn these lessons so desperately. Um, that's the only way I can explain it. So here we are, the inner shift. Our thoughts then, okay, and this is chapter 21, reason and perception. And this is section nine, the inner shift. Are thoughts then dangerous? To bodies, yes. The thoughts that seem to kill are those that teach the thinker that he can be killed. And so he dies because of what he learned. He goes from life to death. The final proof, he valued the incorrect more than constancy or the inconstant more than the constancy. Surely he thought he wanted happiness, yet he did not desire it because it was the truth and therefore must be constant. The constancy of joy is a condition quite alien to your understanding. Yet if you could even imagine what it must be, you would desire it, although you understood it not. The constancy of happiness has no exceptions, no change of any kind. It is unshakable, as is the love of God for his creation. Sure, in its vision as its creator, is it, is in what, oh, I, sometimes, sure, in its vision as its creator is in what he knows, happiness looks on everything and sees it the same. It sees not the ephemeral for it desires everything to be like itself and sees it so. Nothing has power to confound its constancy because its own desire cannot be shaken. It comes as surely unto those who see the final question is necessary to the rest as peace must come to those who choose to heal and not to judge. Reason will tell you that you cannot ask for happiness inconstantly. For if what you desire you receive and happiness is constant, then you need ask for it but once to have it always. And if you do not have it always being what it is, you did not ask for it. For no one fails to ask for his desire of something he believes holds out some promise of the power of giving it. He may be wrong in what he asks, where and of what, yet he will ask because desire is a request and asking for and made by one whom god himself will never fail to answer god has already given all he really wants yet what he is uncertain of god cannot give for he does not desire it while he remains uncertain and god's giving must be incomplete unless it is received You who complete God's will and are his happiness, whose will is powerful as his, a power that is lost in your illusions, think carefully why you have not yet decided how you would forever, how you would answer the final question. Your answer to the others has made it possible to help you be already partially sane, and yet it is the final one that really asks if you are willing to be wholly sane. What is the holy instant but God's appeal to you to recognize what he has given you? Here is the great appeal to reason, the awareness 
of what is always there to see, the happiness that could be always yours. Here is the constant peace you could experience forever. Here is what denial has denied revealed you. Here is what denial has denied revealed to you. For here the final question is already answered and what you ask for given. For here is the future now. For time is powerless because of your desire for what will never change. For you have asked that nothing stand between the holiness of your relationship and your awareness of its holiness. I think for our sake, we should go back to chapter eight or section eight just for a moment and review what that final question that it keeps referring to is. It has it listed twice. The first time it says, and do I want to see what I denied because it is the truth? Reworded into a, a better, I think more accessible way. Is this what I, sh I would see? Do I want this? So I, I uh, think I may have used this example yes last week as well. I'm not sure. But a really great moment in time that many, many people uh, witnessed either in, in real life or, or after the effect uh, was what happened on the Capitol steps in the United States on the 6th of January, 2021. It's interesting to compare notes. What did you see? What were your impressions with people? Because what I saw was something very different than from what most people saw. I saw a lot of hurt people. That's what I saw. A lot of people who feel abandoned, who feel betrayed, who, whether they're right or wrong about it, right? That's a completely different issue whether they're right to feel the way they feel, whether there are facts that back up the way they feel, though that's a whole different subject. But what I saw are people who believe things and who experience things in such a way as to feel uh, victimized and betrayed by what we call the left or what they call the left. And they see a hero in someone who, who they desperately want to save them. And again, we can argue the things, you know, about the things they want to be saved from. That's not the point. They're, that's irrelevant really totally irrelevant. They're in pain. They're in a form of emotional pain. And that is why it felt okay to them to go lash out in the ways that they did and to do the things that happened. Hurt people hurt people. If a person is not in some form of emotional or physical pain, they will not behave in the manner of those people. It's just not possible. That's not how we solve our problems. When we're feeling whole and centered and loved and cared for.
And so, you know, this pair, this whole thing starts out, are thoughts then dangerous? And, and the answer is to bodies, yes. And here's one of these places where the Course of Miracles is talking about how we're not our bodies. But the thoughts that our bodies can have can get us into all kinds of trouble. Because that's not our divinity operating. That's not our connection to source operating when we're acting from the body or the ego. And thoughts are things. Thoughts are actual tangible things. And so when we we have these thoughts, especially if they're of, of, of say, for example, stick with the, the example of, of the violence and, and the, the emotions on uh, January 6th. You know, thoughts like those create more thoughts like those and they build together. And so, yes, it becomes very dangerous. And then the beginning of the next paragraph is really so key. The constancy of joy is a condition quite alien to your understanding. Yet if you could even imagine what it must be, you would desire it, although you don't understand it. It's funny, we all want electricity, but we don't, nobody really understands electricity. But we know how to manipulate it and create it and get it to show up and work for us but we really, really don't understand it at all. And that's really what true spirituality and oneness is. In many ways, it's, it's hard to understand how everything can be moving, even though things appear to be solid, for example, or the, how, how time cannot exist. It, that, that can be very difficult to, to imagine or to understand. And yet we can accept it as a premise and we can make other premises based on it. I know it to be true. So um, it might be a little easier for me than some people. But the constancy of joy is a condition quite alien to your understanding. So to really bore into that and realize that there is a way for there to be a constancy of joy. I experience that quite often. And people think I'm a maniac because how can you be happy? How can you be, how can you be smiling? Why aren't you upset? because I'm looking at it in a completely different way. That's why. And that's the vision that they talk about here in the Course of Miracles. That's the vision they're trying to convey. So I think that will conclude my interpretation of this uh, section for today. And uh, we will start now with chapter 22 and I think probably there's an introduction that's not too long. And then, uh, let's see, the introduction. Yeah, we'll probably read the introduction and, the, and then the first section after that, or the second section, the message of the holy relationship next Sunday. All right, see you then. Until then, have a beautiful, blessed week. And namaste and much love.